This episode is brought to you by Pepsi Wild Cherry. Pepsi Wild Cherry is bursting with delicious cherry flavor and a sweet, crisp taste that gives you more to go wild for. Getting wild may look different these days, but whether it's opting for a solo Friday binge watch or a big night out, everyone can indulge in their wild side with Pepsi Wild Cherry, also available in Zero Sugar. So grab a Pepsi Wild Cherry and get wild. Sports Social, now on the Sports Social Podcast Network. Hi, it's Bryn Lucas from the Autosport F1 and Motorsport Podcast, and you can follow this year's Formula One season with us on the Sports Social Podcast Network. Our expert Formula One team are on the ground at every Grand Prix to bring you regular access behind the scenes and peel back the veil of the Formula One world. Listen to the Autosport F1 and Motorsport Podcast now, wherever you get your podcast. Thanks for choosing this free Anfield Index podcast. If you'd prefer to listen to this or any of our other shows without adverts, then now's the time to check out Anfield Index Pro. With AI Pro, you can supercharge your entire listening experience. You'll not only get all of our podcasts without the ads, but you'll have them far faster with our quick publish feature available exclusively for subscribers. AI Pro also puts you in the heart of our sound studio, with an option to listen to many of our shows live and interact with the podcasters in real time as the shows are recording. Upgrading couldn't be easier. AI Pro is available on all popular podcast platforms and we have our own apps for Apple and Android. Just head on over to AnfieldIndexPro.com and get started today. David. Again. How are you doing, buddy? Long time no speak. It has been a long time. I was quite surprised to get your message on Saturday. <laughs> was it Saturday or was it yesterday? I can't remember. No, it was Saturday and you said, well, we do one tomorrow, which was yesterday. And I couldn't do yesterday, but you could do this morning. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm tremendously top of the league. I don't know about you. Yeah, I'm absolutely tremendously top of the league and Carabao Cup winning champion and whatever. I'm happy to own it. It's... <laughs> it's uh... <laughs> It's going it's, very, very well at the moment. It is, and I'm. You know what? The I think I think you know a lot of fans. We do, we do. Let's let's be honest. We do look down on the Carabao Cup. Um, it's the third level cup, but you know when you win it like that. Yeah. You know when you win it like that. Yeah. It adds this element of pride. Like I, I don't think I've ever been prouder of a team in my life. Like. I almost shed a tear at like a proud dad at how proud I was that they won that trophy against. I know that the other team is shit. I know. I know they're shit. And a lot of people said, yeah, but Chelsea shit. Yeah, but we played fucking kids like to end the game and the whole of extra time. Literally just with our back four yeah. holding on, you know, that's all we did. And so when that happens, there's, there's, you should be proud of it. Everyone should, the whole club, the whole fan base, everyone should be proud of that cup win. Every single person, because it is literally one of those things that Jurgen Klopp should talk about, write about. I don't know how the hell he managed to inspire those kids and inspire people, but it's a story and it's a lesson for man management. For 100%. The football, you know? For man management, for preparation, for togetherness, for team spirit. I mean, we go into that final. You've got now. Look, Allison wouldn't have started anyway, so Kelleher is the first choice cup keeper. But you've got no Trent, you've got no Zabozlai, you've got no Curtis Jones, and you've got none of our best front three: Mo, Darwin, or Diogo Jota. Yeah, you've got Connor Bradley starting at right back, which you know, two months Very ago. Happy with that. It would, would have been unthinkable two months oh, ago. Oh, oh, my God. Then coming off the bench, you've got Bobby he's, Clark. He's He's been a revelation, bro. James McConnell. And and, he's so good. And Jaden Dans, who'd made his debut like four days earlier. What a big guy he is, by the way. But what, what, a, what an introduction to life at Liverpool. So he makes his debut against yeah. Luton, is involved yeah. in a goal. Then he gets launched on in a cup final and plays, including stoppage time at the end of the game, the first half of X time and the end of X time. I think he played like 41 minutes or, or something in total. Yeah. 
Then in his next game, he scores twice in an FA Cup fixture. And then he's on the pitch and playing a role as we get the last minute winner over Nottingham Forest. Like this kid must just think this football lark is the easiest thing going. Why wasn't I doing this a while ago? This, this is great crack. I'm, I'm, I never, we never lose. We win everything. And I'm, I'm playing a big role. Like, it's unbelievable. And, of course, Gerald Kwanzaa also came on. He's been playing all season. But How at the same calm time, is that, lad? How calm is he? Guys, it, like, genuinely, when he's in the team, you don't even get... Notice, yeah. Yeah, that's the thing. Like, there's, no, there's no fear. There's no doubt in him. You're just like, oh, cool, Kwanzaa's playing. Like, he's going to be fine. Like, his debut was away to Newcastle when we had 10 men and were backs to the wall, he came on and it was like he'd been playing for years. Mm. It's unbelievable. Does it All help of these that kids. he always plays with VVD? He's played a couple with, with Ibu. Oh, yeah. Well, Ibu's, Ibu's quality though, right? Do you well. know? So I think once once you're playing with either of them, I think he might have played with Matip earlier in the season as well. Yeah, so like, cup game, yeah. He is fortunate that he's come in and there's the all-time great Premier League centre-back, Ibu, who for me is the second best centre-back in the Premier League. And Joel Matip's no scrub. Like, Joel Matip's a really good player who had a, was having a really good bounce back year until, unfortunately, his knee went. Yeah. But, like, all of these kids, like, the thing that gets me with every one of them, and it's not just these ones that we're talking about. It was Callum Scanlon. It was Luke Chambers. Ben Doak, Cade Gordon, uh, the Kumas kid. They oh all God. just look so calm. They all look like they've been ready to play these roles for ages. And like as if they all have 20 or 30 appearances under the belt. It, it's this immense level of maturity that our kids are, are appearing from the academy with. That's the most impressive thing for me. How amazing is it that the manager that comes in next year sees all of this um, and goes, wow, okay, I've got something to work with here. You know, literally have something to work with in terms of the future and current squad. So there's there's a balance right now. This is I don't think I've seen a balanced squad like this where kids come in and help out. The, like, for example, Bobby Clark didn't look out of place this weekend. Like, he was causing, you know, Forrest some trouble on that left hand side whenever he got into the box or whatever and he should I mean I was wishing that he just dipped that shot that he that he had that nearly went you know just was just over just over the bar he's got a lot to still learn but I didn't think he looked out of place and he definitely wasn't the worst player on the pitch you no. know and so that's that's massive you know that, that that these type of things are massive that kids can come in and in a Premier League game where we've never won in a Premier League I know it's only like four games so it's a bit of a weird statement to make but but Still. we hadn't won there in any competition since 1984. Yeah, it's nuts. 40 years. Like, so we had played them a bunch of times True. in yeah, ooh, cup games and stuff, and then in the 80s and that. And, and Clark walks in. Now, look, there was times I thought he struggled to, to get involved in the game. Mm. But when he did get involved, and certainly his off-ball work, you absolutely couldn't fault him. Nope. And, like, I do wonder with, with the players like himself and Kumas and Dans, it's probably helped that they've grown up in football families where their dads are all ex-pros. So they've been kind of around that professional mindset their entire lives. But it, it will never not amuse me that both Lewis Kumas and Jaden Dans, their dads had... Long professional careers. Wait up, wait up. Kumas is the son of the Tranme Kumas. Yes. Yeah, he's Jason Kumas' fuck? son. He so. was quality, Jason Kumas. I really yeah, liked yeah, him. He, he never lived up to his potential, but he was a he was a really talented player who I think if he'd gotten the right move early in his career, probably wow. probably goes on to have a better career. But we've got a and, couple of second generations in here. Yeah, that's, that's the good. thing. Like we've got, yeah. we've got three of them in the squad, and four of them 
on the, well, well. another one on the way because uh, Kaylor Figueroa, Maynard's son, is in our academy too. Wow! So you've got you've got Jason Kumas and you've got Neil Dans, the the yeah. fathers of Lewis and Jaden, respectively. Uh, Jason Kumas was sixteen, and Neil Dans was thirteen. The last time Everton won a trophy. <laughs> So they were kids in school, went on to have entire football careers, both of them long careers, and now their kids are playing for us. And one of them has, well, actually, sorry, both of them have already won a trophy because they were both in the squad for the final. Lewis didn't come on, but they, 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 their dads were in school and now they've won their first medal before Everton have won something, which is just magnificent. <laughs> Can't beat a bit of Everton slander. No, it's nuts. And I just, yeah, listening to, I missed, I was away with work the whole week last week. I got, I couldn't go to Wembley as well because I was literally preparing for this work stuff. And um, I was in, in, in a, in a bar in Reading because that's where the, um, the event was happening, like a, a golf estate for the whole week with work. And I was emceeing the event. And um, basically I watched it with a couple of Reds. One of them came from America because he's, part of the company he's, he's come over from America so it was a great, it was a full global thing happening um in ready and honestly we there was Chelsea fans in there and it was just like when that goal I mean I was nervous I never thought I'd be as nervous as I was in the Carabao Cup final as I was for this but when that goal went in at the end I leapt off my stool I nearly tripped over someone's bag because people are coming in just coming in on the Sunday night traveling in I am running around that bar High fiving all the Reds. It is absolute pandemonium, <laughs> and I, I don't think I've ever. I think because he had the space, you don't do that in a stadium, right, or in your house. Mm. But the space, I just ran like as if I scored. I ran, I ran up as if I scored. It was just honestly, what a moment, what a moment. But like you said, the last since we lost to Arsenal, mm. all of those games have felt big. They've all felt because we've had this massive injury crisis. I'm not sure we've we've had this in the past and we've completely collapsed. Yeah? Yeah. Last two times it happened or last one time it happened. We completely collapsed as a squad. We, I think the big difference is that it's not in defence this time. And because Verge is there. Like, yeah. I really want to talk about Verge a little bit because I've been so impressed of the, because he did have a shaky start maybe, but this season, but oh my God, the last three or four months. He, I don't know. I think he's even better than he was in 18, 19 and 20, you know, 1920. He just, there's something about him right now, which is like grab the game from the scruff of the neck and just go for it. Like, I don't know mm. whether he's more inspiring or whether he's, he's just a, the proper alpha is now the captain. Like, you know, he, he was always the alpha in yeah. the squad. But now he's the captain and he drives, you know, great leaders not only have to, you know, command respect, but they have to deliver on the pitch. Yeah, the That's great the leaders, thing. That's right? the thing. Like, gr- great leaders have to be among the best players. That's just how it is. Like, you look at the great captains over the years, like, Roy Keane was always one of the best players for United every single game. Carlos Puyol, the same for Barcelona. Graham Souness for us. Brian Robson for United. These were great leaders, but they were great players. And part of being a great leader is being able to lead by example, to go out and be the best player on the pitch and get your teammates to raise their game to that level. That is, yeah. that is what leadership is. Virgil has been the leader of this team since the day he arrived at the club. That is just the fact. If some other fellow wore the armband, Virgil was always the leader. You can tell that because when he was out injured in the 2021 season, there was a complete lack of leadership in our team, and we were awful for a bunch of that season. Last season, it felt like Virgil almost took the year off because he just didn't seem locked in, didn't seem motivated, whatever was going on. He just wasn't there. And the leadership wasn't there at all in that team last year. 
So while other lads got the credit for leadership and for setting the standards, like the standards at this club are set in terms of players by two guys, by Virgil and by Mo. Now, I know there's other great professionals have come and gone over the years, Ginny Wijnaldum, Sadio Mane, et cetera, et cetera. But those two lads are the ones that drive the standards in terms of performance level. But also, if you look at Mo, is there any player anywhere in the world who takes better care of themselves than Mo? Like, the guy is 31. He's ripped to bits. He's always in the gym. You hear countless stories from young players. Elliot. Elliot is like, I just so, worship this guy. Yeah. Literally. Talking about how they're trying to model themselves on Mo, how they're trying to model them their, their gym routines after Mo. They're trying to do all the little things that Mo yeah. does. I've never heard these stories about, about other lads that were credited with set standards. Nobody set standards who's A, the 11th best player in the starting 11 or be a squad player. They're not setting any standards at all. They might be hall monitors. They might make sure you're not on your phone, that you're not late. They might do those type of things. They're basically prefects. They're not leaders. This yeah. is leadership. What we're seeing from Virgil right now, and it, like it's little things that he does. Like He's always the last one to celebrate with the goal scorer and give them words of praise. On on Saturday, when the whole celebration was over, he stood he'd already been in and celebrated. He stood back, waited for most of the others to move away. And then he said to Darwin, look at that. And you could see him pointing at the fans who were just showing pure adoration for Darwin. And he got Darwin to drink that in. And Darwin's always going to have that moment now of turning around and seeing the traveling cop, singing his name, loving him. And you could see Darwin, just this smile broke out in his face. That's what leadership is. It's not pointing and shouting. It's not having tantrums. This is what leadership is. And the guy is, without question, the best centre-back the Premier League has ever seen. It's not even close anymore. I wanted to just go back to um, your point about Mo, and, and 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 I wanted to veer off to talk about Elliot. Now Elliot's nowhere near got the quality of what Mo has, but having someone like that help you. I don't think we get through this period without someone like Elliot. If that makes sense, uh, we really needed him. Mm, Harvey's been thing. unbelievable of late. Yeah. Like I know he's not. It's not always coming off for him, no. and he's having some frustrating. But games. we forget he's it. like. 19, 20 years old. He's 20. So you could, like, what I love about Harvey, because there's definitely, I think there's a ceiling on what Harvey can be as a player, because he's not, he just doesn't have that little burst of pace. That's and if the he only had thing. that, it'd be, it'd be different. But I love how much that kid cares. Oh, like, he gets fan? brought he's off. A fan? He's a fan. That's the big thing. He gets brought off on Saturday. Now, Bear in mind that Harvey has been playing an immense amount of football of late. So he starts in midfield in the Bournemouth game. Then we play Fulham in the Cup. He starts in midfield. Then we play Norwich in the FA Cup. Uh, I think he came off the... Oh, he didn't play at all in that one. Sorry, he didn't play at all in the Norwich game. Then in the Chelsea League game, he came off the bench. Then in the Arsenal League game, which obviously turned out to be a disaster for us, he comes off the bench. Then we play Burnley in the league. And again, he's coming off the bench. So he's settling, settling into a bench role. We go to Brentford away. Uh, again, he's coming off the bench. Then we play Luton at home. And Harvey starts right wing. Then we play that cup final. Harvey starts right wing, has a shift in midfield and plays the entire 120 minutes and is running nonstop. Then we play the FA Cup game a couple of days oh, shit. later. He played the full 120, didn't he? Yeah. And somehow he's still got legs to play in the Cup game three days later against Southampton. And then he's back out here once again, putting in a big shift, started 
in attack, moved into midfield. I think he went back into the attack before he got taken off. But he goes off. Now, that lad has put in monumental shifts in the previous two games. Previous three games, excuse me. Previous three games. Mm. He's brought off and he's furious with himself. Like, he's not congratulating himself on another hard grafting performance. He's furious that he hasn't been able to win the game for us because he cares. And, you know, there's a there's one or two lads in the squad that I've I've taken a little bit of umbrage with this year because I just don't feel like the effort level is there. With Harvey, even if the performance level isn't there, there's never, ever, ever a question about the effort. That kid gives a shit. And the more kids you have in the squad, the more players you have in the squad that give a shit, the better you're going to be. And at this club, giving a shit and putting in maximum effort game after game, that's enough for the fan base. Like if you're trying and you're working and you're not a liability out there, this fan base will adore you. And that's right. That's why he's rightly getting so much praise because there's games obviously where he plays brilliantly. And as a sub this year, he's been spectacular for us. The starts haven't always been great, but the effort level in those starts, and you can tell his fitness level has gone up this year, which I would attribute to him working with Mo. Are you that person who has everything? The coolest merch and those must-have fan threads? Well, over at our Anfield Index shop, we've gone that extra mile when it comes to pimping up your Liverpool collection. From our popular range of bespoke design t-shirts, sweaters, hoodies and hats, to our signature edition mugs, prints and coasters, all provided with fast worldwide shipping. We have something for every red. We also stock official LFC merchandise and are licensed with the Premier League and UEFA to sell official iron-on shirt badges and sleeve patches. As a listener to this podcast, you can get 10% off everything with coupon code AIPRO10. Just head over to anfieldindex.shop or find us on Etsy by searching for Anfield Index. Yeah, I can't argue with any of that. I just can't. And I think that's where that role model conversation and then the Harvey Elliott stuff comes in. And I think, you know, this is the making of Harvey. Um, Liverpool squad and 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 obviously going forward, whoever the manager comes in is going to have uh, an abundance of talent, really. But again, I think using Harvey in the right places is the key. You know, where where will his lack of pace not hurt? Like playing him centrally in, it's got to be out wide somewhere. I think playing him centrally that's going to cause us some issues. Do you get what I mean? That's we we need a few more pace. I mean, <laughs> Joe Gomez playing. Um, Six. One of the great things of him playing there is his pace. Yeah, he can catch people up. But I mean, there's he can get lad. to people quickly. Yeah, we need to there's talk about Joe, who who was written off by by people who, without question, had a stinker of a year last year. The previous year, he was trying to work himself back to fitness, so the performances were up and down. The previous year, obviously, he misses the whole season. Well, most of the season with a horrific injury. And it will never leave my mind hearing the fatigue index pod that Sai and Marty did and hearing Marty describe what that surgery is like, like stitching two horses' tails together. That will never, ever leave my mind. That When Marty said that, I was like, there's just no way he's coming back and he's ever going to be able to play at a high level for us again. And this year, whether it's right back, centre back, left back, holding midfield, Joey Gomez is putting in shifts and he's doing what the team needs him to do. And again, I would say a big reason for Joe's confidence, for Joe's development is Virgil because Joe and Virgil have been close for a long time now. And whenever Joe seems to have a little moment in a game where things start to get a little rocky, there's one guy talking to him and that calms him down. There's one guy that seems to just have that ability to get Joe's mind switched back on, and it's Virgil. Yeah. And Joe's been magnificent for us this year, absolutely magnificent. I know people had some issues with his performance as a six against Southampton. He'd never played there before. 
And yet, four, three days later, he's gone out in the Premier League against a better Nottingham Forest team than the Southampton team he played. And I thought he was good. Thought he was good of the six. Some of the passing wasn't great, but I thought everything else was good. He dropped into left back then. He was absolutely fine there. He went to right back. He was absolutely fine there. Like, having a guy like him, this is... Remember people used to talk about the Milner role? He's he's the new Milner, but like 10 times better. But, but much better. But much better. Like, yeah. th- this is the thing. Like, having lads like him and like Harvey, who Harvey's played right side midfield, he's played right side of the attack, he's drifted to the left side of the attack. He'll do what... These lads will do whatever is needed of them. And they don't gripe, they don't piss, they don't... They just do what's asked, and they put in maximum effort. And that's why we're top of the league. It's Obviously, it's the Salas and the Van Dykes of the world, but it's the Harvey Elliotts and the Joe Gomez's and the Connor Bradleys and the Costa Simicuses and the Bobby Clarks and the Jaden Danzes and the James McConnell. It's these lads and the Queeving Kelleher. It's these we lads haven't even that are really about him driving yet. <laughs> the bus on this. How? These are the lads pushing, pushing us up the hill. Yeah, how big, you know, big Kev. He's definitely... Um, bigger as well he's getting yeah. bigger with every game big big kev right he quivin kelleher is i mean you have to take your hat off to him because he doesn't get to play much at all and then mm. when a couple of times when he did play he looked really poor you know like early in the season yeah he was letting in some bad goals but you look at it now and you think jesus when this guy gets a run of games he he we we haven't even mentioned allison no but this like, has always been fucking insane. He's like Ellison is our god. Like Alice is the best goalkeeper in the world. <laughs> He's the, the best the Premier League has ever seen. And yet like insane. Up until probably when the injury happened, which was the day before Brentford, I think. Yeah. You hear the news that he's out, and your immediate thing is your stomach drops because yeah. shit. Because Quevin was look. Quevin was really good in the twenty one twenty two cup runs, without mm. question. He was really good. He was. He wasn't good last year, and he only played four games the whole season. You could tell and he wanted to leave, right? You could yeah. tell it was a player that, that was wanted frustrated. Play. Yeah, and he just won two cups. Was a major part of them, mm. and just wanted to go and play Don't regularly. His wings. Team. Like the, and you the, can't blame him. Like I wanted him to leave just for himself. Yeah. Like same. I know we're selfish, right? As play as 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 fans and stuff. Oh, we want the second. We want the best reserve keeper in the world. You know. Like I would say he is the best reserve keeper. Anyone has has anywhere as a reserve keeper. That is that is the pinnacle, right? Yeah, he's definitely so, in the mix. No question. So like he's definitely in that mix. But uh, there's a point where in the kid's career, you want him to go and earn big bucks. You want him to yeah. go and make his name and i suppose he's you know ali is injury prone um uh, alison is injury prone every year he has a couple of months out now it's whether quivin is happy with this couple of months. but obviously right now i don't think he'd be happier than he is he'd just be like bloody hell if see, ali the, came back i'd probably keep my spot right now that's the thing like the, the see the thing for quivin was right quivin turned 25 in november and he had started this season poorly as well. He had a couple of really shaky performances in the Europa League. And we were talking about him on on Raw after one of the games, myself, Trev, and I think it was Jim Boardman. And we were we were concerned because it looked like he'd he'd hit that level in 21-22, and we should have cashed in and we would have gotten a big fee. And instead we'd held on. And it looked like it was another mistake like we'd made with Nat Phillips. But he was 25, and I think he'd played 26 games in his senior career. And, like, that's just not enough football. And the other thing with Quevin as well that was probably driving his frustrations is Quevin really wants to play for Ireland. Like, it really matters to him to play for Ireland. And he's number two for Ireland because Gavin Basunu is number one. And the biggest reason Gavin Basunu is number one is that well, Kelleher had played 26 games by his 25th birthday. Gavin Basunu has just turned 22. He's played 156 senior games. Now, Quivin is up to 
the 39 senior games because of the cups and because of this run and whatever else. So he's getting more experience. And because he's getting those games, you're now starting to see him perform at an absolutely elite level. And this version of Kelleher is the best version we've seen. And this version of Kelleher would be the Irish starting goalkeeper over Basunu. The issue is for Cuevin, when Ali comes back and he drops back to the bench, what happens from there? Like, is he going to be able to come back in for, let's say, the FA Cup, for, let's say, the FA Cup semi final? Is he going to come in and play the way he is right now, or is he going to come in and look like a little bit rusty? Like, Cuevin is a very, very talented goalkeeper. And the two big strengths he has one is his kicking, which is excellent off both feet, but two is composure. Like, there was a moment in the Forest game where he got pressed. And he was getting pressed from two sides and he just slid a pass up the middle. Like a really calm, mature decision. That's my best outlet. I'm not going to boot it long. I could, but I won't. I'll just play this little pass here. And that that is happening because he's getting these games, because he's playing regularly. And we're seeing him make big, big saves. We saw two incredible saves at Wembley. We saw two or three big saves against Southampton. We saw the big save early in this game. Now, Alanga might have been offside, but yeah, Kelleher didn't know and he wasn't flagged. Nope. Yeah. So, like, this, he's another one that's just stepping up massively. There's, there's a list of players. Like, when we win, when we win, if we win the league, <laughs> the majority of the praise will, will go to, Vir, to Virgil, to Mo, to Ali, to Trent, to Alexis, to Darwin to whoever. But yeah. there's going to be a long list of these squad players who will deserve every bit as much praise because it's really hard to come in cold and match the level of a team playing really well. It's even harder to come in and re replace world-class players and that's what these lads are doing. Bradley's standing in for the best right back in the world. Harvey's standing in for the best wide attacker in the world. Cuevin's in for the best goalkeeper in the world. And yet, there's no... The, now, obviously, there's certain areas where there's a bit of a drop-off. But in terms of the team performance, we're still winning. Yeah, well, I mean, still Bradley, winning. Bradley, can we just focus on him for a few minutes? Yeah. Like, he is... I, I, I've never been so excited by watching a kid play. Like, that guy has no fear. Like, I don't see any ounce of, like, I I can see when Trent is worried, or I can see when Trent's under pressure. This kid does not show any pressure. <laughs> He's just like, yeah, I'm going to go and shoot. I'm going to go forward. I'm going to invert now. And, you know, I mean, obviously he's guided by his manager when to do what to do because he's still a kid. But Jesus Christ, confidence-wise, mm. he, he's just lost his dad. Yeah. And um, I, I was almost tearing up when I was listening to him talk post-final about, you know, he's just been through the roughest time of his life and stuff. And this is, you know, this is amazing and stuff like that. It just, it was, yeah. I mean. I love the way he described Chate Dads and, and Bobby Clark and Cut McConnell coming on as when the young players came <laughs> on. Uh, this kid's mindset yeah, is bulletproof, gangs. Yeah. It's absolutely bulletproof. Like, in that final, there's that flashpoint moment where, he gets involved in a little bit of a wrestling match with Ben Chilwell. And Chilwell puts his hands in Connor Bradley's face. And Ben Chilwell is 27 years of age. He's, you know, he's a 50 million pound, well, he, he calls 50 million. He's not a 50 million pound footballer, but he calls 50 million. He's won 19 or 20 caps for England. He's very highly regarded in football. He's a big name in football. And Connor Bradley, A, wasn't intimidated. At all. Chilwell is mouthing at him. He's chirping at him. He's trying to get him involved in something. And Bradley's just like, what are you going to do? Like, what are you going to do? Like, this is the thing. Connor Bradley has taken an absolutely horrendous moment in his life, the passing of his father, and he's spun it into, like, something to go and do this for, to go and make his dad proud. 
to go and take on the family name and the family legacy and and make positive impacts in his life. The the kid is unbelievably good. Like, I don't know how good he's going to be as a player. I, I like I, I can't sit here and say that he's going to play five hundred times for us, but I know he's going to have a really good career, whether that's at Anfield or, or elsewhere. Now, obviously, you would hope it's going to be at Anfield and. Certainly everything we've seen so far has been really positive. But what I know is he's going to have a really good career because his mindset is just perfect. He's got all the right attributes as a, as a human to go and be a very successful footballer. And, like, again, we're missing Trent Alexander-Arnold, the, yeah. maybe the best right back ever a kid that revolutionized the game. Mm. And we, we don't, like, Connor Bradley's in the team. Oh, good, Bradley's playing. Great, looking forward to seeing him again. Like, there's no, there's no, oh, God, it's, you know, we've we got a kid playing there and it's normally Trent and, you know, what Joe Gomez would be the backup, but we've got this kid there because Gomez was needed the left back. you just like, yeah, great, Bradley's playing. Absolutely fine. He'll be he'll be seven out of ten at least. There's no worries there. And like there's another kid. Plays right back. We're playing in a, a cup final. A cup final. We've been preparing with him at right back. Played right wing in the end. 20 odd minutes in, Gravenberg goes off. Shit, now we need to reshuffle. Joe Gomez is coming on. Harvey, you're going into midfield. Connor. You're going to have to go and play right wing. No worries. I'll do that. Grad, just give me the ball, lads. And like the thing with, with him that really impresses me is he demands the ball. Like Virgil picks up the ball, left side centre back, and Connor Bradley is gesturing at his feet. Give me the ball here. I've got space to move into. Virgil gives him the ball, and there's no thought of, I'll just knock it back to Ibu and kind of get my touch in and get a little bit comfortable. Not a word about it. Get the ball in, knock it ahead of himself, and he's away. He's going to go and he's going to try and take someone on or make something happen. He's going to progress the play. It, it's brilliant to see. Like, it's absolutely brilliant to see every one of them. Every one of these youngsters is demanding the ball. Like, I don't care if I've played five times and you've played 500 I belong here. I'm more than good enough. And I believe I can help this team. So give me the ball and let's go. It reminds me of the time Wenger um, just used to bring kids into the team and they just used to keep playing the same way. You know, the, yeah. the, the top Arsenal team, because they'd set up the, the, you know, the academies to work in the same way Wenger was coaching. So when they came in, it was literally, hey, we're playing the same way. This is your role. You already know it. Just do what you were doing in your role and you'll be fine. And it's kind of like these guys have come in because they've been playing. And I think I heard they were saying that they've tried to implement the same type of play, you know, throughout the, the academy as well. It's just like they've come in or, or even they spend a lot of time with in the first team um, uh, training sessions. So they're literally training with the first team all the time. So it's easier for them to fit mm. in and come in. And I don't know, it, it just feels, it, we always wanted that. We always wanted the yeah. feel of, hey, this would be great if we could have a, a, a youth team that could literally just come in and, and perk us up. You know, Man United did it back in the day. Arsenal then did it. This would be great if we got a, if we got, um, you know, a, a generation of players that came through that all came through together yeah. because they've all played together. And so they, when they're playing together, they're actually more comfortable. Because they know That's exactly the what the other team's the players are going to do, you know. So, and like, um, it's a, yeah. a big factor as well is having that combined training ground and academy, yeah. where it's all one. Now I know there's the separate parts to the building for yeah, yeah. the academy, but at the same time, it, it's not about just training together. It's about being around each other. It's about those kids seeing Mo Salah walk into the building, seeing Virgil walk into the building, seeing how they conduct themselves, seeing how they go through their gym work, you know, seeing what time they're there till late in the day, getting extra work in, being prepared, 
It's about them being around Jürgen and Jürgen being around them. And like when when they're out doing their work and one of them glances over and Jürgen is stood there, hands behind his back, legs spread wide, just intently watching them go through their work. Like imagine the boost that gives you. Like imagine the the desire to show like Jürgen, I'm ready. I'm the next one. I'm ready to play. Like that's got to be massive for all of these kids to be around these standards, to be around these coaches and these players and to really get to understand what level it's going to take. And then, like you said, you've got all these youngsters that are going and training with the academy or training with the first team, but then they're going back and playing academy games and they're telling their teammates first team training is different like you've got to be ready for this 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 and this the technical level is so high and whatever else and all of them are then in their own minds getting ready for that they're all hyper aware that on a tuesday morning they could walk into training and someone might say ibu kanat is getting treatment this morning so we need a center back so you're going to have to go and train with the first team and all of those kids want to be ready so that when they go and train with the first team, it's not going to be a case where at the end of it, Jürgen says to Pep, right, he's not ready anytime soon. So let's send him back and get someone else up here tomorrow. They all want to be getting that call back day after day because of what, what an incredible way to improve. Like Bobby Clark might have only played a handful of games for the first team. Jaden Dans has played, what, now four games for the first team. But they've had... 20, 30, 40 training sessions with the first team. So they're already part of the group. And by playing together and training, once it comes to the game, they're already in tune. Like Bobby Clark is going to know that when Alex McAllister has the ball, he's going to look in these areas. So I want to be in one of those areas to be available for that pass. And if he picks me out for that pass, I know where that ball is going. If he plays it to my right side, he's telling me there's someone on my left shoulder and I'm to go that way. If he plays it to my left side, he's telling me that's the space to move into because Alex is super intelligent and that's the type of thing he does. His passing leads players into their next movement and these young players are getting in tune with that. Connor Bradley, we saw it at the weekend. What do we see? Three or four switches from Virgil right mm-hmm. onto his chest. But Bradley... Mm-hmm having trained with Virgil and obviously haven't played a bunch of them now, he just knows if I take up this space, this is one of the passes Virgil likes to play. And this gets us 30, 40 yards up the pitch. Oh, and by the way, I now have the ball in space with an opportunity to do something like these little things are massive. And that's what's contributing to us having such a successful season so far. I agree. I agree. And, um, it's just so refreshing. Every, every, everything this last, since the start of the year, you know, let's let's not be around the bush. We lost not only players to injury, but we lost Endo and Mo to, you know, the Asian Cup and the AFCON as well. And then Mo got injured. I mean, and Endo's now injured. We're, we're missing Curtis. Um, it's nice to see um, Dom back. You know, I hope Dom stays fit now because uh, we really need him next week. Hello, I'm here to annoy you. I'm here to annoy you into listening to more of me and more of others on EPL Index. We don't just have the Anfield Index stuff. We've got EPL Index as well, which covers the entirety of the Premier League. And we have three podcasts and a whole bunch of really good writing on EPLindex.com. The podcasts are my own two-footed podcast, which is every day at 4 p.m., Monday through Friday, covering the whole league. We have a tad predictable hosted by Tadiwa. You know Tadiwa, he does Anfield Index. He presents a tad predictable before every Premier League match week. And then Kevin DeVries and his crew on the EPL Roundtable there every week after the Premier League match week. So make sure you listen to everything we're doing on EPL Index and follow us there on Twitter at EPL Index. Thank you. Bye bye. And and I think I think the um, I mean imagine we get to April and everyone's back fit, Dave. Yeah, like, like honestly, we just need to power through this month somehow. 
We just need to get through this month somehow, I think. But it's only, it's only, like, if you, like, it's not. Let's have a look at the fixtures. It's not yeah. always perfect, but PremierInjuries.com do a pretty good job at mm. maintaining regular updates on players. Without. So we know Joel Matip is done for the season. None of us have him in, in the forefront of our mind anymore for this season, but obviously you want him to make a full recovery and come come back and play at a high level. Diogo Jota, they're saying middle of April. So that's not too far away. Ali, Trent, Besetic, and Curtis Jones, they're all saying after the international break, which is Brighton. That's only one league game between now and then. We've got City, then we've got United in the Cup, and then we've got two weeks of international break. So, potentially, we might play Brighton on the 31st and have all of those lads back in the squad, which would be absolutely enormous. Huge. Mo, the hope is that he's back for City. Yeah. Gravenberg, now that's going to be an interesting one because we haven't really gotten any clarity on that at all. Jürgen said it was ligaments, but he didn't say how severe. So, But he might be back after the international break as well. So there's another body back. Thiago's the other one. Again, have any of us really relied on Thiago this year as we were thinking in our heads during whatever you were doing and you were bored and you started to think about Liverpool? At any point, did you think in any seriousness, God, when Thiago comes back, and plays 20 games in a row, we're going to be great. No, because we know what the situation is there. It's unlikely. Like, the fact that he played against Arsenal was a surprise. Yeah, That's his only appearance since April of last year. We're a year. We're coming up on a year since Thiago really played football. And unfortunately, he's probably not going to play for us again. So you take out him and Matip, Mm. And we may well get to the start of April and Jota might be our only injury issue. And yeah. everyone else might be back. Have you, have you looked at the fixtures? Because I didn't, I didn't realise what's going on. Um, because obviously the United game, the Everton game's gone. Mm. So I don't know when they fit that back in. Because it's it, after the United game, it's, is it international break? I think after it is. After the United game is international break. So we literally, we've what? only got one more, one Premier League game left yeah. this month. Yeah. Like, that's crazy. So literally, it's City next week. We just got to win. Yeah, we just have to avoid loss. Even, I mean, it depends on what happens with Arsenal. I'd rather we, I'd rather we win. But you know, we just, we just can't. If do. we beat City, yeah, I think City will beat Arsenal. And if you yeah. look at Arsenal's last ten games, gags, it's by far the hardest of of the three clubs. They've got five really tough aways. They've got City away. They've got Spurs away. They've got United away. They've got Wolves away, where City lost and we got battered in the first half but came back to win. And they've got Brighton away. Like, that's five really tough away games that Arsenal have. So I I think Arsenal are going to drop points in three, maybe even four games between now and the end of the season. Bloody hope so. They're on a good run at the moment. They are, but here's the thing. There's there's three teams in this, right? The two of them know what it takes to win the league. City. Yeah, I saw, you, I saw your tweet yesterday, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Arsenal are peaking at the wrong time. They do it all the time. Far too early. They did it last year, they did it the year before. <laughs> and then they bottled it in the last 10 games of the two seasons. That's, that's the sign of a badly prepared team. Their manager yeah. doesn't know what it takes to win because, let's remember, he's never won, even as a player. The guy played for Everton. Guy was at Arsenal in and they were shite. And they were fairly crap under Wenger and like the FA Cup and finishing fourth was their yeah. double. And he's like, already done that. Yeah, he's like he, he's not he's not got that winner gene yet. Now he might get it at some point, but for now all he is is a checkbook manager with a Lego head. But we get through City, then we don't play in the league for three weeks. Yeah, we it's play quite Brighton. good. It's good. And yeah, we might good. well have Trent, Curtis, Ali, Besetic all back in the squad. Now, I don't think Besetic is going to play a whole a whole lot for us this year. But even if he just gets minutes, it saves legs of someone else. A hundred percent. You play like, him in, like you in, might Europe, play him in Europa, the Europa League. 
So do you, do, a question for you. The United game obviously is now on. Our, mm. We've now got two United games at Old Trafford coming up, which is a pain in the ass. But do you do you mind us going out of the cup? I mean, at the end of the day, it's going to cause... I mean, it's a quarter final, so I guess if you win it, you're in the semis and you're going to Wembley. But at the end of the day, the amount of... With what the problems we've had in terms of fixtures and, 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 and injuries... You know, it, it means something else moves again. Like the Everton games move, something else will move as well with the semi. You know, what is your view? Would you, are you asked whether we've got through or not on, on you know, April the 7th, on April the 7th against United? If you told me we could either win the cup game at Old Trafford or the league game at Old Trafford, I would I'd much win rather win game. the league game without question. I, I If we were to lose the cup game... <clears throat> It would be annoying because they're shit hmm. and we shouldn't be losing to them. But at the same time... If we're resting players, though. Yeah, that's the thing. If we use that as an opportunity. Now, the only thing is, because it's the international break after it, I no, think before, Jürgen will it, go no, full strength. Before it? No, no. The international... So we go... From, from today, we yeah. go Sparta Prague on Thursday, City on Sunday, Sparta yeah. Prague next... Thursday and then yeah. United in the cup. Oh, sorry. Yeah, I'm looking at the wrong one. I'm looking at the league. Yeah, you're right. It's, it's, yes, you're right. Yes. So we'll probably go full strength there. Then okay. we go Brighton home after the international break. Then Sheffield United home. So the, and that's another massive thing to consider here is that th- three of our next, no, all, all of our next three league games are at home. And four really? of our next five league games are home. Yeah. We go City. Then we don't play again in the league till the 31st of March. We play Brighton. Oh, Jesus. Then we play Sheffield win all United. Three. Yeah, got to win which all we'll, Which we'll win. Then we go to Old Trafford, and it's the day before my birthday, and if they let me down, I'm going to be fucking furious. <laughs> and then we play Crystal Palace. Well, we'll have a, I think in between there will be the Europa again. The Europa League quarterfinals will pop up somewhere around there. That Everton yeah, the game, like you said, has late, to be right? fitted in. Yeah, I mean, look, it, it's just going to be hectic. It is. It's going it to be. be we've a lot of, we've, I think, 22 potential games left this season or 20 26, potential games. 21 or 26, something like that. It's mental. <laughs> but the thing is, we're going to be getting players back as well. And like mm. Trent is like, Dominic obviously came back, yes, on Saturday, but he didn't really come back because he didn't really get involved in the game. Um, no. But I think Darwin his presence does make a difference. I think oh, it gives confidence to people. He's got a bit of pace about him. Yeah. He's going to press you. One thing that Dom does is if he if he's not having a good game on the ball, he's a he's monster. He's yeah. a monster off the ball. Like he won't stop running. And yeah. the opposition are fucked because it's like they know he's got pace. They know he's going to press. And and that, that adds a lot of value. Adds a lot of That's value. That's the so, thing. So we get him back. Let's say Curtis comes back. At the end of the at the end of March, and let's say Gravenberg does as well, mm. and Bobby Clark has shown he's capable of being thrown into a game. Harvey can play in midfield, and maybe Besetic is back, and all of a sudden we go from God, we've got two senior midfielders and some kids to well, there's eight options now that you're happy enough with. I, I really hope next week in City it's Endo Mac and Dom. I yeah, really me too. Do. Me too. So hopefully, the midfield back. to go with. Yeah. Endo, well, Endo came on against Forrest and Oh, he did, didn't he? I forgot. Yeah, yeah and, so he was fine. He and, he, and, he, and he looked okay. I, I think he just had some bruising on his ankle, uh, which is and they probably swelled up, which is why they probably Fucking put him Concedo. in the I saw that challenge. Yeah. They put him in the moon boot. But, like, uh, it's a lot of games, but I don't think Jürgen would want it any other way. What I will say, though, is Sunday against City, this needs to be like a historic Anfield atmosphere. Yeah. Like that place needs to be absolutely shaking from an hour before kickoff. And the city, because the city players have shown a propensity to get nervous at Anfield in the past. We, in league games, in Champions League games, like even last year, we were, we were shit. Muck. We were as, Nearly as nearly as bad. We were nearly as bad last season as United are this season. Mm. City won the treble, and yet at Anfield, the crowd was unbelievable. 
and we won the game 1-0. And the crowd will play a big part in that. So if the crowd is absolutely raucous and we can turn that into a real, a real statement of intent on and off the pitch, I, I think we can beat them. Like I watched them against United yesterday. I've watched, I've watched most of their games this year. There's something not quite right with City this year. Now, again, like us, they know what it takes to win a league and they've obviously won a bunch of them. They know that you, you you manage your way through games up until a certain point and you want to peak in April and May. That's the only time where you really want to be firing on all cylinders is April and May. Yeah, I heard you say to someone that the title race hasn't started yet. It starts... Yeah. So that's for 10 games. It, it's so literally a city is... The, the, city is our 11th last game. <laughs> and so then C- City's 10th last game is Arsenal. My God, that's the title race. I think, I think let's say next weekend, the title race is on. If we, if on. we beat them and they, and they draw with Arsenal or beat Arsenal. It's so good. It's, it's so good for us. Like, it's absolutely so perfect for us. And it puts us in a great position. Because you look at our remaining games, that Everton game will get rescheduled. Ever desperate. Like, absolutely desperate. I know they'll get up for the derby. But they're desperately bad. <laughs> Brighton are a, a good team, but they're very, very open at the back. Very open at the back. And they can be got at and they can be exposed. Sheffield United are garbage. United are not good. But again, it's United. They'll get up for us. It's at their place. But I'd still expect us to go and win. We'll beat Palace at home. Fulham away is tricky. Like that, They're just a, a horrible team to play against. I still think we can beat them. West Ham away, it depends on what West Ham turns up. We should beat either version. If the bad version turns up, we'll hammer them. Then we go Spurs home. That's a tough one. But if we get through that, there's only two league games left. Villa away and Wolves home. And if we've been able to maintain that four-point gap on City, we only need to win one of them. And it's over. So even if we went to Villa and drew and City and Arsenal won their games that weekend, assuming neither of them had dropped points along the way either, we'd be going into the last game home to Wolves, knowing that if we win, the title's ours. That's the first time. Uh, Third time try. Third time lucky with Wolves. (laughs) Yeah. Mm. That's the thing. But but what's happened the last two times we've needed to beat Wolves? We've beaten them. Yeah, and City have had to win. And City have won the league because they've had the advantage, but we've gone and done our part. Yeah. If we get to that final day of the season with Wolves at home, do you think, like, there'll be lads running onto the pitch to score a goal, dressed in a full kit and a Darwin Nunes mask, (laughs) if they have to. There's not a hope that if we get to that final day against Wolves, and we know that a win gets us. Those last four games are massive, ain't they? They are. They're huge. They're West huge. Ham away, never easy for us. Um, although I think we will do them. Um, I think Spurs at home, Villa away, and and Wolves. Wolves are dangerous this year. They are, but they might be under. They might be under beach by then, though. That's the thing. That's the hope. Like, but when you look at Arsenal. They've got Ars- Arsenal's running is by far the hardest. But I think City's is harder than ours as well. So last 10 for City, they have uh, a re a, a game away to Brighton, not home, away yeah. to Brighton to be rearranged. That's tough. They've got yeah. Arsenal home. That's tough. They've got Villa home. That's tough. They've got to go away to Spurs where they never they've do struggled. well. Yeah. They've got Fulham away like us. Yeah. They've got Forest away who made it very difficult for us. Now, they get yeah. Wolves as well at home. And again, you'd, you'd fancy them to win it. Yeah. But their running, I think, is harder than ours. If we get through the City game, their running is harder than ours. And the Arsenal one is just murder. Like, I, I actually nearly... Like, it's because they've had the easiest run so far. They get Brentford next. Well, actually, sorry. They get Sheffield United tonight, then Brentford. They'll win both of them. Hmm. They've got a rearranged game with Chelsea, and I know Chelsea aren't good, but Chelsea play really well against City and Arsenal. Arsenal. <laughs> yeah. And they should have beaten Arsenal early in the season. Then they've got City away, Luton home, 
Brighton away, that's really tough. Villa home, Wolves away, Spurs away. Bournemouth home won't be a pushover. They've got United away. And then they finish off last day of the season with Everton. Now, normally you'd say, well, Everton will just roll over because it's Everton. But there's a chance that Everton went to that last day needing something to stay in the division. Yeah. And if Everton go there needing something, and Sean Dyche, think back to last year, Sean Dyche beat Arsenal with Everton not long after taking over. So he knows what it takes, and he has a, the type of physical side that can cause Arsenal problems. There's always a chance, but I think they'll I think they'll be out of it before the last game or two anyway. I think there's too many drop points. But if we get through City, even with a draw, even with a draw, I think it's in our hands because we have the easiest run in. Yeah. Or I think it's, so, it's not easy, but it's the easiest of the so three. So what happens if we... So if Arsenal win both their next two games, they will be on... They'd be, they'd be ahead of us on goal difference. 64. And if we draw against City, we'll be on 64. Yeah. That means they'll be top of the league. Damn. On goal difference. But they have a okay. much tougher uh, run. So yeah. let's, let's just say we draw with City. Hmm. And then City and Arsenal draw. But we beat Brighton. We're two points clear again. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's you gonna know what be I mean? it's gonna be a roller coaster, man. It is. It's it is. There's gonna be twists and turns. It's gonna be exciting. Obviously, they've both got well, City are gonna be through in the Champions League. Arsenal have a deficit to overcome against Porto, a Porto team who, at home. They smacked the shit out of Benfica at the weekend, five nil and looked unbelievable. <laughs> oh shit. And Arsenal <laughs> Arsenal thought they were gonna breeze through against Sporting last year. Didn't happen. I'd rather Arsenal win though because I so need them I. to be busy. I won. Yeah. But then I thought about this, and somebody hmm. was pointing out: if you look at Arsenal's fixtures under Arteta over the last while, when they are not playing as regularly, they tend to wobble. Their wobbles tend to come when they're not playing two games a week, when they don't have that continuous momentum. So it's you have to. I'm, I'm wondering: is it better for them to go through and have the extra games, because it might only be two extra games, but they're extra games, or do we bank on Arsenal falling out of rhythm, whereas ourselves and City are playing every three to four days, and we're building up that muscle memory and we're building up that momentum. And I know Dan Kennett doesn't believe in momentum, but I think players do. And I think when you're winning games and winning games and winning games, you start to feel unbi- in, in, invincible. You start mm. to feel like no matter what, eventually this win is going to happen, which I think is exactly what happened with us at the weekend. Our lads just kept believing this is going to happen. We win every game. We're going to win this game. So we're just going to keep going. And eventually we won the game. And that that factors into that belief and that drives that belief that, yeah, we do win every game and eventually we're going to score. And there's nothing you can really do about it we're eventually going to win and you might as well just give us the ball now. <laughs> Whereas with Arsenal, if, if, they have a bad, if they have a bad result, let's just say they lose to City. And then their heads let's might say, drop after that. Their heads might drop after their that. Their heads might drop. And let's say they play Luton and they win, but it's not impressive. And then let's say they lose to Brighton. And now they've got an entire week to stew on that loss before they play their next game. That type of thing for a mentally weak team, which is what Arsenal have shown themselves, to be the last two seasons as they bottle top four and then bottle the title, that mm. might just really get in their heads. Yeah. Do you know? It's interesting. Really, really interesting. I mean, I have to go shortly, but just a few last few things on players like Nunes and uh, McAllister, who, 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 I mean, McAllister may be the most important player in the squad at the moment. And I think uh, Nunes is stepping up whilst you know the goals have probably been lacking, and the and the conversion rate of the of the big chances has been poor. The what he's contributed from a creation and goal scoring perspective combined is still fan, fucking fantastic. Yeah, you know. And um, at the end of the day, I I just hope he stays fit because Darwin is is literally our X factor, and McAllister is becoming. More and more, like as the season grew, his importance grew and his role grew, and he's kind of found himself as the the trusted 
player in midfield. Like people are just always giving him the ball, giving him the ball, and there probably couldn't have been a better ball than it to fall to uh, outside the box than it than it did last week. You know, on the weekend, mm. and what a fucking cross! What a fucking cross! Like shimmy turn, put it in, and um, yeah, Darwin did the rest, and I loved how Darwin stayed on. Like he literally leapt to stay outside. Yeah. Did you see the lead replay? It was like, right, I need to get outside here. Big did you jump. See, did you see Virgil? Yeah. Shoving the defender to make sure Darwin was on was on site. Darwin has so good. 25 goals and assists this year. 14 goals, 11 assists. Super. In 2,200 minutes. Yeah. He's He'll averaging a goal or assist yeah. every 88 minutes. Yeah. I like... When Bobby was doing not as good, we were loading him. Yeah. So I, I love Darwin. I, I just absolutely adore the fella. He's he, another passionate guy. Yeah, he's mad as a brush. He gives a wants shit. It. He wants it. Yeah, he wants yeah. If you need players, Dom wants it. You know, Mac wants, wants it. it. The players Diaz are coming. They all, I mean, Endo Diaz, again, it. gets frustrating, but there's no lack of desire, is no, there? That's the thing. Another one that put in an absolutely enormous shift in that cup final as well. My God, Unbelievable. he ran and ran and ran. And like, yeah. the thing is with, with you know, the, the South American lads, like there's just an in, an inbuilt fire in them. But Alexis is like, just so calm and calculated. Like just, just think for a second. Hmm. Back to last year. So Endo wins that ball. Or, or causes Forrest to cough it up. I think he touches it. I think he does touch it. I think though. he does. I think he knocks it from one on to the other. Yeah. And that's how it breaks to, because Awani has, has a first touch like a curb. But <laughs> Ali gets it. Now, just think back to, to a year ago. That ball breaks on the edge of the opponent's penalty area to a Liverpool midfielder who decides to cross it. And without looking, clips across to the back post to absolutely nobody because it would have been eight feet over everybody's head. This fella had the composure to take it in, to turn, to assess yeah. his options. He looks at Darwin. Like there's a moment where their eyes meet and both of them know this is what we're doing. Yeah. And it's the perfect left-footed cross. And what a finish, man. And what a finish because he's moving backwards and having to readjust. It's an yeah. unbelievable goal. It's an unbelievable goal, but this is an unbelievable footballer in Alexis McAllister. He's the signing of the season, while other clubs are trying their very hardest to justify spending £105 million on £60 million footballers. We spent £35 million on £100 million. Dude, footballer. remember how down we were about Caicedo? Yeah. Fuck now, me, I will say, Gags, around. if we had him, I think we'd be eight points clear. <laughs> I genuinely do. I think, I think, you know, when you go into... I know a lot of people are pissing on him and calling him a bad player, but you know it's about the environment you're in. Yeah, Chelsea's environment is akin to United. Does anyone think Endo would be would be doing as well if he went had gone to Man United? No way. No, look at like, look at Amrabat. Exa- exactly the point is going to make. If we'd signed Amrabat, Amrabat would be playing well. Yeah, because he'd be in a good environment with a good manager, with teammates that would believe in him, with with a, a camaraderie and a, a united front. Among yeah. the squad. Amrabat's issue at United is the manager's shit. It's the mm-hmm. same issue all the other players have. It's the reason Bruno's fed up and clearly looks like he wants to go. It's the reason Rashford looks like he doesn't care anymore. It it all comes down to the culture and the manager. And at Chelsea, the culture is is toxic. It's horrendous. There is well, there is no real culture at Chelsea because the culture was always driven by people like John Terry, which is going to be a selfish culture not a team culture. It's very different at our club. And Jürgen is obviously the, the biggest reason for that, but obviously the, the captain is massively responsible for that too uh, in Virgil. he's He's been one that's preached that since the day he arrived at the club. But if you, if you look at our results with Endo in the team starting, 17 games, 15 wins, two draws. Now imagine if he'd started all season. Do you know what I mean? Like, we we are in a position where we're going to be very, very strong in midfield once Curtis gets back because we'll have Dom, Endo, and Alexis plus Curtis. So now you've got four starters for three positions, and now you can mix and match. And Curtis can play instead of Dom. 
he can play instead of Alexis. You'd have no problem if we lined up with Dom, Endo, Curtis, with Curtis, Endo, uh, Alexis. We've seen Dom, Alexis, Curtis work really well. So you'd have no issue with, with any of those combinations starting, which puts us in a really strong position once Curtis is back, because our defense, like you said it earlier, our defense is rock solid. We've got Virgil and we've got Ibu. So once we have them, and to be fair, Gary Neville highlighted it at the very start of the cup final. They were talking about how Liverpool were weak and missing so many starters, et cetera, et cetera. And Neville goes, they've got Van Dijk and Kanate. They're going to have a chance. And as long as we have those two, we're going to have a chance. And now our midfield is getting reformed. Darwin is back. Mo is coming back. Eventually, Jota will come back, but Diaz is in form. I've seen people say, mostly Arsenal fans trying to convince themselves, oh, Liverpool, it's not sustainable, they'll slip. These are our results since the 1st of January. A 4-2 win over Newcastle. What wasn't sustainable about that? A 2-0 win away to Arsenal in the Cup. A 2-1 win over Fulham. A 4-0 win over Bournemouth. A 1-1 draw with Fulham. A 5-2 win over Norwich. A 4-1 win over Chelsea. We lost 3-1 to Arsenal with half a team missing. We beat Burnley 3-1. We beat Brentford 4-1. We beat Luton 4-1. We beat Chelsea 1-0 in the Cup. We beat Southampton 3-0. And we beat Forest 1-0. There's no pattern with those results. There's nothing you can point at and say, that's not sustainable. Because from one game to the next, we're winning games in different ways. We're not relying on last-minute winners every single game. We're not relying on going out and blowing teams away early. We're finding different ways to win every single game. And that's why I think this can sustain. I don't need a VPN. I've got nothing to hide. <laughs> this is what I used to tell myself before I hooked up with LibertyShield.com. Not only is my home internet now fully encrypted, but I can now access all the websites I want, whenever I want, and do so from absolutely anywhere. As a Liverpool fan, I love to know I can now watch every match, regardless of whether it's on UK TV or not. My Liberty Shield VPN makes sure nothing is blocked and guarantees me super fast streaming speed throughout that match. You can get connected right now with their software package, which includes a 48-hour no-obligation free trial and instant access to their apps for Apple, Android, Fire TV, PC, Mac and Android TV. Or go a step further like I have and get one of their pre-configured VPN routers. These small but powerful devices allow you to easily connect every device in your home to VPN, making it the perfect solution for smart TVs, mag boxes and games consoles. Visit libertyshield.com today and use coupon code AIVPN25 to get 25% off at checkout. Yeah, I'm, I'm really hoping so. I'm really hoping so. I mean, it just goes back to the thing you said about Endo. <laughs> How important it is just to have a functional DM in the team? Like, just having someone who can actually play it. Yeah. Just make sure you, you know, they don't have to be Fabinho uh, quality of 20, no. 18, 19. They just need to be someone who can actually do it and protect your team and, and, and have those. It's those fouls. It's those, it's breaking up the play. It's, you know, it's those things that really help. Um, the ones but like the look, look that at that goal at the unpunished. weekend. Look at that yeah. goal at the weekend. Like so important. Most teams would have given up by then. Most yeah. teams would have. That fella, they they have the ball in their box, and he goes, "I'm going to go and get that ball back." And he goes and he presses Hudson Adoy, and he gets a nick on it, and then he still makes a challenge on a one e. The ball breaks to Alexis. Like, well, he nicks it, and then he runs wide. So he yeah. drags a player with him. And wide. creates space. Yeah. Because he's clever. Mm. But that, that involvement is every bit as important as Alexis' involvement and Darwin's involvement. Of course it is. Because without the him, ball. they moved the ball. the ball 60 yards down the pitch. Yeah. Completely And agree. that's the thing. Every player, every player is making these big contributions in game after game. Like, Think back to the cup final. It's obviously Costa Simicus with the corner, Virgil with the header. How do we get that corner? Bobby Clark drives into the box, gets a shot away, deflection, corner. Bobby Clark played a part in 
winning that, it play, won that corner to win us the goal. The corner at the weekend that led to Endo winning the ball back. Joe Gomez wins that corner. Everybody is contributing. Everybody is playing at a high level. And like we said really early in this pod, even if it's not always coming off for them, they're relentless and the effort level is there. Yeah. And the thing is, you've, you've mentioned it a couple of times, next year there's going to be a new manager. So number one, all of these players owe their careers to Jurgen Klopp, all of them, because without him, they wouldn't be where they are. So they all want to repay him by winning a league title. But they also know that there's two managers who've been strongly linked, and we won't go into them today, but there's two managers who've been strongly linked. They are probably watching quite a lot of Liverpool right now and trying to get a handle on the squad. And, you know, what will I need? Is he going to be good enough? Can we keep him? Does, what, what do we do with him? They're all playing for the futures as well. All of those young players are auditioning for the, for, for the future because they know that Xabi Alonso and Ruben Amram are going to be watching these games, whether now or during the summer, they will go and watch all of these games. And these lads have to perform. And it's likely in all of their minds, like, I'm, I'm auditioning for my future here. I need to show not only my respect for Jürgen and give everything to get Jürgen his second league title, but I also need to show the next manager that he doesn't need to buy somebody in my position. So that's massive. So they're, they're doubly motivated there. And like we said, with all those young players, there's a triple motivation because they don't want to be back playing in the under-18s next week or the 21s. They want to be continuing to play with the first team because they're probably getting a little bit of extra cash as well. But, I mean, we, we couldn't be in a better place right now. We literally couldn't be. So everybody just needs to lean into it, enjoy every last second of the Klopp era, but be excited for the future as well because yeah. he's leaving behind Amazing a near-perfect scenario for anybody to walk into. We don't need a rebuild. We have a squad that's a couple of pieces away from pretty much perfection. We've got yeah. an academy really starting to churn out talent. And if you think the boys that are playing so far are good, the kid that came on against Southampton, he's the one to watch. Trainee Oni, he's the real gem of that academy. He's the one that all the coaches are saying is destined for the top. So... Wow. Things are, are really exciting for this club right now with the age profile of the squad, with the talent in the squad. There'll be, there'll be money to spend in the summer as well. And not only that, but this is a squad of winners. This yeah. squad is going to give up the ghost because Jürgen left. They're going to want to keep winning because ultimately that's what football is about. It's about winning. It's never about the taking part. That's just for, for strange people that never won anything. No, and I think, I think one thing for Jürgen, in his last season to go through such a crisis, but deliver at the same time. Like we've gone through crisis before uh, where we lost like all midfielders or we lost all defenders. Right now, we literally lost all of the midfield and the, and the attack, right? Like the 10 players out, a couple of defenders in there as well. Like we had Robbo out for extended. We've had Trent out for extended. Luckily we've, uh, you know, we've got Matip out. We've had to call mm. on Joe to play right back, left back. DM, we've had to have um, Bradley come in. Uh, and then we've literally relied, relied on Kwanzaa, Panati and Virgil in, in, in defence. Those have been the backbone because Ali's been out as well. So literally, three players have been a backbone of like, you know, rotating in, in defence. Everyone else has been changing. Everyone else has been injured or coming in and out. The, I, I actually think this is one of his greatest achievements. And I know people mm. probably sniff it at me because of what we went through when we lost Burge and then when we when we lost Fab and a whole load of midfielders one year as well. But honestly, this is, I've never, I was so demoralized when we lost 10 players. Like, mm. I was like, how, what, what bad luck. Like, Brentford losing four players. Yeah. I Absolute was like, what madness. the fuck? Everything's against us. Because up until then, we still had a good squad. We could still know, compete. You know what, Jürgen? 
he probably wouldn't want it any other way. He wants it to be as hard as possible because he just wants to constantly... Because for him, it's it makes his team talks much easier. Easy. Now yeah. he's got all these things. People are doubting you. People don't believe, Connor Bradley, that you're ready. Yeah. Harvey, there's people on the internet saying you're not good enough. No. Like, and also, that is absolute gold for Jürgen. And I think he probably has somebody on the internet going through Twitter and Facebook and wherever else. Look, look, printing out comments and giving it to Jürgen. Look what this fella said about Gerald Ponce. He said he's too, he's too slow. Gerald, come here. This lad said you're too slow. <laughs> Not good enough. Said you're not going to make it because you're too slow. I think, like, I think the other thing, Absolute the goal. whole squad and Verge, especially the guys that are leading the squad, like Verge and others, are probably saying we have to do this for Jürgen. You know, we have to do this for Jürgen. And so not only do you have whatever Jürgen's saying, but you have the squad uniting to say, whatever we do, this is it. We, this is all he's got. We need to send him out. We need to send yeah. him off as a winner, you know, as, as one of the best Premier League managers ever. And the only way to do that is to keep winning. So there's, there's multiple drivers here and I, and I get it. And I think, um, I don't think it could be any better. And I don't, I've never been so surprised, so so pleased, so proud of a squad that's been so hard hit uh, and still do what they're doing, churning out these results. And, you know, I, I get negative during games because I'm like, but I don't blame them. I say, look, this is so such bad luck. I I always say this is just shit luck for us that we don't have the players. I just shit luck. But then as I say that, they go and pop up and score another winner. And it's just like, fucking hell, they just keep, they just keep producing. It's amazing. Yeah. And you can't but applaud them and, and give them all the plaudits. You know, Liverpool 2.0 is, is on, I don't know, it's on speed. You know, I don't know what it is, but it's it's crazy. It is. It's, it's nuts. It's fucking crazy. But like, if they, can, if they yeah. can finish off the Jurgen tenure with four trophies. <laughs> We're asking it, for a quarter. No, 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 but like, I mean, look, it's, it's, it's there to be done. It's possible. We're, we're still in them. Yeah, I don't know that we'll win all four. I don't know <laughs> that we'll win another one. But yeah. at the same time, they're all going to be looking at it and going, "We came so close two years ago." Mm. To, two to games, four. We yeah. came so close. If we just won one of the league games, we drew mm. just one of them. We'd have yeah. won the league. If we, like, if we hadn't had the Thiago injury prior to the Champions League final. And Jürgen could have just gone with the midfield he, I think, clearly wanted to start, which was Naby, Fab, and Thiago. He yeah. had to hold Naby back because he didn't think Thiago was going to be able to last. Mm. If he'd been able to... But we could have gone and Madrid were there for the taking. So, like, there's definitely going to be motivation from there. And, you know, you, you, look, at, you look at the makeup of our squad just very quickly. Virgil, roundabout pathway to get to where he is. And one of the, the knocks people have, he was at Southampton until he was 27. Well, we signed him when he was 26, so you're just wrong. Andy Robertson was on the dole at 19. Do you know what I mean? Like, yes, he didn't please. have the easy path. When no. Turo Endo was scrapping against relegation last season yeah, in, in the Bundesliga, when we signed him, people went, who? Yeah. Do you know, Darwin and Diaz grew up in poverty that most of us can't even imagine and have had no. to overcome so much. Darwin overcame an ACL tear at 17 that could have ended his career. Yeah. All of these lads have overcome so much. This season, they're having to overcome scandalous refereeing decisions that went against us. Oh, in the injustice of it. Being the Spurs one. Yeah. And... And then all of these injuries and all of these lads are, are just like, I mean, you think when Darwin Nunes gets a bump on his foot, do you think he gets worried or do you think he goes, ah, I've been through much worse. I yeah. guarantee you Darwin would have played the last few games if they'd let him. Dominic would have played the last few games if they'd let him. They're just being really careful now. <laughs> they're being they careful to. with them. But if we line up against City with Kelleher and goal, Virgil and Ibu at centre back, and then whatever two full backs it is, whether it's Bradley and Robbo, Bradley and Gomez, Gomez and Bradley, 
to Gomez, be honest, I'd I'll play just, Gomez at left back. I really I, would I against City well. just because he's so Bowen, strong. I yeah, he's so well. much stronger. And then you're going to have all going well, Dom, Endo, and Alexis in midfield. And then you're going to have potentially Mo, Darwin, Diaz in attack. Like, I'm not being funny. That team's more than good enough to go and beat City. And that's without Trent, without Ali, without Curtis, like it, and without Jota. It's still more than good enough to go and beat City. So, yeah, th- there's no reason for people to be down in the dumps. Obviously, we've got this game against uh, Sparta Prague to get through. The kids send, are going to play. Send I've all the kids. Feelings. I've send all the kids yeah. and look if we go out of that competition so be it yeah, so be yeah. it the league is there to be won the league is what really matters we've gotten to the point there's 11 games left and we're top with City at home to come and then as I said earlier the easiest of the three run-ins of the top three if someone had offered us this at the start of the season we would have thought they were on crack because this is year one of a rebuild but here we are so go and fucking win the thing. Absolutely. Go and fucking win it. Um, I need to go. Um, it just shows you uh, that we spent, you know, an hour and a half talking. We didn't mention the 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 the, the controversy from Forrest. But hey, it's that minuscule and nonsensical. Yeah. That we didn't even I know. That's enough. We don't need to talk anymore about it. It's fucking horseshit. That's the best way to leave it. Jesus Christ. But Dave, this has been awesome catching up. I'll try yes. and do it once a month um, if we can as going forward. Give the people <laughs> what they want, gags. Yeah, so many people have been asking for it. Thank you so <laughs> much for, for asking and um, wanting me back. But uh, yeah, life has been crazy. I, I miss my one of the you know big you know, Liverpool games. I miss the Southampton game because I was just so busy last week, literally working 7 till 11 every day. Uh, and and the, for the first time, I actually was an MC at an event, and um, you know, the podcasting really, really helped my confidence. So there's one yeah. thing that I will take with me is how much Anfield Index really has helped me uh, grow, um, you know, as a person and as you know, with qualities that I never thought I could. And I remember Dave, you and you and Richie were two of the people that really pushed me into podcasting. So I just want to say thank you because I don't think. I would have been able to achieve last week if you guys didn't push me into this. So, you know, it was the people like the thing with you guys. And I know we're going to, we're wrapping up, but the thing with you is you have a really natural, like warm disposition. You're a nice, per- you're, you're a good person before anything else. And you have a nice demeanor and you're quite even keeled. You don't, you don't tend to drift too far one way or the other. But when you laugh on a podcast, it's absolutely infectious. And that was like, we're going back over 10 years here. That was one of the things, one of the great bits of feedback we got in the early days was when gags laughs, you want to laugh with them because it's infectious. And that's why me and Richie pushed you to be on more and more and more and not take some sort of like, I'll just jump on and do five minutes of stats. Be on it. It's yours. Your, you and Richie were the, the, the minds behind it. And shout out to John Richie. Hope he's well, whatever it is he's doing with himself on this fine Monday. Um, but yeah, I mean, you have to, it made sense. Your, your positivity and good demeanor balanced out my rage and fury and everything else. And then you just had the lovely Scottish voice of Richie in the middle. And then who, obviously whoever else was joining us on the day, whether it was Marco or Cy or, Dan Kennett or whoever it was that was coming on. And I, I still, to this day, will randomly, I, I have pretty much, I think I have the first hundred podcasts Wow! on different hard drives. And every, every so often I'll just randomly go back and listen to one. And we've obviously all gotten a lot better. Oh my God, natural. it was awful. I but was they're awful. fun to listen to. Dude, I was so nervous. I was yeah, so but we nervous. all were. Not just you. We no, were you were not, man. You were just on it from day one. Fuck that. Like, you know, to this day, you, you're the best podcast I've ever worked with. The hands well, down. I it'll always, that. It'll always be, it, it, I don't think anyone will top it. And I know people probably get offended with that, but it's it's true, right? And it just made me feel very comfortable that I knew I had someone on the other side, that's going to handle it if I can't, you know, speak up. But 
uh, honestly, that's what made me better is, is, is the level that you, you are at. And, um, you know, like I said, this week is probably the most, um, fulfilling professional week of my life. And I don't think I would have been able to do it without all of these experiences. And if you go and read, you know, listen back to some of the early ones, Jesus Christ, I was shitting myself on every pun and it was fucking recorded. It wasn't even live on though. They were, they, they were, were fun. so much fun. They were just like, were cause we, we get on. We, it wasn't even we, serious business back then. It was just no, fucking. <laughs> but we'd all ramble for like 20 minutes before we'd even start. And then we'd just go off on tangents. We'd be talking absolute bobbins. But it was just fun. And like, we I just like random things. Like I was thinking the other night about, we did one. I was living in Oz, obviously, that first year. <laughs> it, was, it was late, late at night. And we had Brian Durant and Paul Dog Leash on together. And I just remember listening to Brian talk about the old and like the older times. And then obviously we had Fidzy on and he's mm. like the ultimate storyteller. And we had Tony Evans on. And I know Tony's not everybody's cup of tea, but when Tony, like with Jan and like with Brian, when they talk about the seventies and eighties and you're, you know, me and you are, are are too young to really remember that in the time you just sort of sit back and it's like you just listen to someone tell you this story and it, it would they were just they were so much fun and there was so many great people over the years that came out like i listened to one about two weeks ago and ryan mctiernan was on with us and he was just brilliant like he was just, he, he he was he was so he funny was, he was incredible as a podcaster yeah honestly He's, you uh, he's doing quite show? well for himself now. Coaching, he, he coaches underage football. Wow! And he plays a bit of music, and he's he's a really good guy, writer. great writer, and yeah. also when we remember when we used to do the quiz show. Yes, he was incredible as well. Really good, really yeah. good. But like that's the thing. Like we've had so many good heads down the years. James, uh, Jason Roberts, uh, yeah. Jim Fishlock, mm. obviously was was a big part of of Anfield Index for for yeah. for a while. Sounds- obviously. Jim, everybody was. I was thanking done really everyone. well as a coach as well. When, when we did six thousand episodes, I, I, I for there was a reason why I thanked literally anyone and everyone who yeah. contributed. It's, it's it's important that everybody gets thanked because there's contributions everywhere. Yeah, you know, and obviously the contributions that people don't see, like yeah. Guy and Nina now, but back in the day, Johnny Starlight, John Moore. <laughs> what a what a massive part of Anfield Index in the early days he was as the original editor. Oh uh, my god. Hilarious because you know, like he's in America. <laughs> Remember when he used to fall asleep? We were like, where's the pod? He's like, oh shit, I fell asleep. Fell asleep, man. Sorry. <laughs> it's like, what? Do you remember when he did the quiz show and he, he got a couple wrong and he's like, oh son of a bitch? <laughs> One of the funniest things. Because it's so natural and, and so authentic. And if you don't know, John Moore now is actually doing stand-up comedy. Um, and he's really, really good at it. He's really good. He's naturally funny. He, he's got some clips on, I think, on YouTube, but you can get them on his Facebook as well. Uh, yeah, shout out Johnny Starlight. What, what a, what an absolute diamond of a human being. Yeah, they, they, all the people that have been on have, yeah, have made a difference in one way or another. Another good guy. Oh my god, long time ago. Yeah, it's been years, dude. It's been years. Yeah, we've got through a lot of people. Ten, but- ten years. Ten and a half years, pretty no. much. Yeah, ten and a half years. That's that's incredible, right? Yeah, all, all off a couple of Twitter DMs. We were thinking of starting a podcast. You fancy but on it? Oh yeah, why not? <laughs> why not? I'll do that. I was I was trying to figure out how many of the six thousand have I been on, <laughs> and Some, then someone and on then, LinkedIn, someone on LinkedIn said Dave's been on all of. Them. <laughs> Yeah, most of them, like, because then I was thinking as well, how many have I actually <laughs> done over the years? Because obviously oh. I've done, I, I don't know, probably easily a thousand for AI, easily, because the Daily Red is, no, is five way more, weeks. So way it's probably more, like way more. 2,000, right. maybe two and a half thousand. Plus all the other ones I did in the early days where I do guest spots. And then obviously two footed every day. That's coming up on a thousand episodes. I think it's it's over 800. Like Jeez. it's it's just mad because it's I've, daily, right? Yeah, so daily, I must so. have done the better part of three and a half, pushing four thousand podcasts. They say once you hit ten thousand hours of doing something, you've mastered it. So 
I'm not quite halfway there, but I'm getting there. Someday. I think I think you're fine. Honestly, yeah, I, I think, think so. you're doing. Yeah. I think you're doing just fine. Right, Dave. We better go. I hope yeah, you, you better go do some work, and I go, yeah, go do I some hope, podcasts. I hope you guys enjoyed listening to us back, and uh, we'll try and we'll try and do it monthly for sure. But yeah. Thank you, Dave, for everything. And uh, thank you all for listening and supporting Anfield Index. Um, yeah, I'm sure there's a shitload of content to come this week as well. So, yeah, until the next time, up the Reds. We hope you enjoyed listening to this Anfield Index show. Please be sure to subscribe to our channel so future podcasts find their way to your device automatically. There's nothing quite like fan engagement, and we'd love to know what you think of anything discussed on this show. The best way to get in touch is over on our free Discord community, where both podcasters and listeners debate the hottest LFC topics 24-7. Sign up free now at anfieldindex.com forward slash Discord. You won't regret it. You can also follow us on Twitter at Anfield Index and find us on Facebook by searching for Anfield Index. Oh, and before you go, we'd love it if you could leave us a five-star review on your favourite podcast app. It only takes a couple of seconds, and it means the world to the people who create these free shows. Sports Social Podcast Network.